return to our discussion of anti-fragility. Remember, we drew distinctions between the fragile, something that has something to lose from disorder, from volatility, um, the robust, something that can withstand that sort of change, disorder, volatility, without being affected, and then the anti-fragile that actually has something to gain from disorder, something that gains um, as a result of the black swan type event. So ideally, we would like to be anti-fragile, and also we'd like to design organizations that are anti-fragile, that actually can gain from the various disorders and black swan events, the unexpected things that can happen to have a big impact on us. Now, how do we do that? Well, that's what I want to talk about today. How do you actually construct something that's like this? As we saw last time, it requires a certain kind of decision making. And it requires you to stop thinking about problems in the way that most of us think about problems. Because we typically think about the average situation, the typical situation, right? We operate according to defaults and we think, okay, here's typically what goes on. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing that. That's the way we should, I think, get through the world most of the time. But if we're thinking about large scale <laughs> ways of thinking about life or business or how to structure an organization, it's one thing to focus on the average, the everyday, and quite another thing to focus on what happens in these more extreme circumstances. For example, suppose I'm setting up a business that's going to make some money day by day. All right, that's good, but what happens if there's an extreme event? What happens if there's an extreme economic downturn, for example? What happens, and I've lived long enough to see this through a number of stages of Austin's history, is that times are good, all sorts of places open up, and then there's a downturn in the economy, and all of a sudden a lot of those places close. Okay, sometimes it's a general thing. People open up restaurants, they do well when times are good, and then in a time of recession, the restaurant fails. That's an indication that as long as things are fine, yeah, you're good, but you're fragile, right? And if there's some kind of downturn, you're in real trouble. Actually, the most extreme example of that I've ever seen was the opening of 10 million, it seemed like, um, frozen yogurt shops all at one time. <laughs> what was up with that? <laughs> um, I mean, there is a place for a few frozen yogurt places in a city, but all of a sudden, they were everywhere. And something like that happened with mattress stores. All of a sudden, there were mattress stores on every corner. On Anderson Lane, there were two right across the street from one another. And after a merger, they were owned by the same company. <laughs> um, you might think, you know, Maybe we sleep a lot in this town, but how many mattresses does anybody really need? Um, how much frozen yogurt does anyone really need? It seems obvious that these were highly fragile business models. Yeah. It's also really common that uh, mattress places are fronts for illegal activity. That's Is like that the right? Most common, um, like fronts. That's very interesting. I had no <laughs> idea. That gives a whole new perspective on this. Um, Whoa. <laughs> well, I will admit, you know, one time I went into, this was a restaurant years ago, but I went into this Chinese restaurant, and my wife and I were the only two people there, and they acted really annoyed that we were there. And they did make us food, and it was actually pretty decent, but when you go into a restaurant and people are like, oh, they're actually customers, um, <laughs> like we have to make food. <laughs> They were really upset about it, and so we ended up thinking that had to be a front for something. That wasn't mostly a restaurant, uh, because usually restaurants don't react by thinking, oh, a customer, <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> so yeah, that's a disturbing. Mm. OK, well, all right, you learn something every day. Now, how do you create something that is actually going to not only last through, be robust in the sense that it will last through, for example, an economic downturn, but actually benefit from it, actually gain from it, where volatility, a sudden improvement in conditions or a sudden decline in economic conditions can help you. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And it requires something that is not necessarily completely in place of your focus on the everyday, but it does require you not to just to pay attention to the average, to the everyday. In fact, you've got to focus on the extremes and think about those. So how do you do it? 
Well, we've talked about these black swan events as things that are really unpredictable. In advance, you cannot see them coming. So if your goal is to say, well, we'll focus on the everyday and we'll just have really good planning and we'll have a really good forecasting department and we'll try to anticipate all those black swans, it's not going to work, okay? That's not to say you shouldn't forecast. There were some consultants that came into Austin Energy at one point and said, ah, you don't need to forecast anything. Get rid of the forecasting group. Um, that's very stupid. I mean, <laughs> you need to plan around the everyday thing. And with electricity, you need to think what kind amount of electricity is going to be needed 10 years from now and so on. But you can't just do that. You have to think about the more extreme events, too. So you need a form of decision making that is different from the one that most of us use. We focus on the averages. We tend to ignore the small probability events. You can't ignore them. There is a cognitive danger here, because insofar as you start thinking about them, you can become obsessed with them and exclude everything else. But still, you need something that is fundamentally non-predictive. You need to have a form of decision-making that doesn't rely on your ability to predict the future. <clears throat> so how do you do it? Well, here is the metaphor <laughs> that Tayeb uses for this. It's the barbell. Well, a barbell in the gym tends to look like this, right? And you put weights on either side. But think about this as actually asymmetric. In fact, the image is on the front of this book. Okay? The asymmetric barbell. Now, what's the significance of that? The thought is this. You want to pay attention to these sorts of extreme events. You're not going to be able to predict them, but you want to set things up in such a way that you can gain from them. So you want to recognize asymmetries, and you want to try to respond to these asymmetries in the right way. So one way to put it is this. You want to adopt a bimodal strategy. You're not going to think just about the everyday. You're going to think about extremes, and you're going to think, in short, about, yes, the typical, <laughs> the typical sorts of situations, and then you're going to think about the more extreme situations. And you're going to have two strategies, okay? Now, for the everyday stuff, you're going to play it safe. There's no reason to take risks. You want to be able to succeed day to day. So, when you're dealing with the ordinary, you want to play it safe. <clears throat> but on the other hand, when you're dealing with the extraordinary, that's when you take risks. So here's a simple example. You're healthy. Should you take various drugs that... I have a friend who's healthy. He's in his 70s, but... Uh, and he has no particular health problems, but he spends a large portion of his income on various supplements. And so occasionally, he, I see him in the street, and he proceeds to then talk to me for 45 minutes <laughs> about what supplements he's taking. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I'll say, well, yeah, I'm taking this pill for this and this pill. But, you know, he's not sick. The, the, this strategy says, look, Ordinarily, play it safe, but that doesn't mean take every pill known to mankind. In fact, who knows what these various things do? Most of these things are kind of untested. It's not clear whether they have benefits. It's not clear whether they have harms. So the idea is, look, when, when things are going fine, just pay attention to the everyday. Don't worry about that, and don't do this. In fact, look, part of playing it safe means do no harm. That's your first rule, as in medicine. Don't do any harm. So... We could put it this way, <laughs> practice the via negativa. Now, in philosophy, that tends to mean the attitude toward God that says we can't actually say anything positive God, about God. We can only say what God is not. But here the idea is epistemological, and it's a little bit different. The thought is, look, we know a lot about what's wrong. We don't know nearly as much about what's right. So <laughs> we're kind of foggy about what's right. 
We know what's wrong, what doesn't work, way better than we know what does work. And so the general thought here is, look, don't come to firm conclusions about what is the case. Worry about what isn't the case. So in this situation, we don't know whether some of these things are going to improve this basically OK circumstance or not. So don't mess with them, OK? Play it safe. Don't intervene. Try just to do no harm. On the other hand, in extraordinary circumstances, that's when you want to take risks. And you want to set up things so that you can benefit from extreme events. So for example, let's say you're investing money. You could take quite a bit of your cash, if you have any money, and put it into things that are very safe investments. But take a small amount and invest it in very risky investments. Now that's not the way most investment professionals think about things. They think, oh, I want things that are going to balance risk and reward, so I'm going to put the most of my money in something that I think is the right mix for me. He says, don't do it that way. Keep most of it safe, and then take extreme risks with a small part of it. Why? Well, because there's a limited downside, but there's a big upside to that. So here, yeah, you're just going to be doing this. But here, suppose you lose everything and you put only 10% into this risky stuff, you lose the 10%. But what happens if there's a huge gain with that 10%? Among the things you invest in in the 10% was Microsoft in 1979. Then you're a millionaire, <laughs> okay? Yeah, I don't know what I was spending my money on. In well, I, I, was a, I was a grad student in 1979. I didn't have any money. <laughs> but if only I had bought even one share of Microsoft in 1979, I'd be living in, oh gosh, if I had unlimited money, where would I be living? <laughs> I was about to give you just some sort of say, I'd be living in the south of France, like a couple of my friends, but that's not true. I'd probably be living in a Pittsburgh penthouse. <laughs> so anyway, what would we do here? Yeah, here the thought is, look, there's limited downside, but a huge upside. So here's an example of this in medicine. Do you want to give lots of medication to somebody who's basically healthy? No. Play it safe. Don't mess with them. On the other hand, suppose somebody's desperately ill. Then take risks. They're dying. You can take risks. How bad is it if you make them die a little sooner? Okay, it doesn't really make that much difference. But if you save them, it's a huge difference, right? So, so try not to mess around with people who are basically okay. Save your messing around for the people who are really sick. Um, and <laughs> There's some weird ethics, okay, yeah, so. It kind of makes sense, though, because it's like, what if they're dying, so they could live another year, it's like, what kind of quality is that year? Like, is that even, like, worth, like, they do, like, statistical calculations for this, so, like, the value of statistical life, and, like, statistical life years, and it's like, a year, like, for me, is, like, not equivalent to a year for, like, my grandfather, so, like, prolonging his life for years of mine, like, in, like, an objective court case, like, where it's super fine, and I see something, like, they would decide with the younger person. Right. Okay, good. There's a bill in front of Congress right now, and I'm, not, I'm blocking on what it's called, but it's about allowing people who are terminally ill to use experimental treatments that haven't yet been approved by the FDA. Um, and the idea is, look, okay, we want to protect you from going in and taking some ordinary medication, let's say, to help you get rid of an infection and dying because it hasn't been tested. But on the other hand, there's this... Ex you know, experimental treatment, we don't know yet if this works or if it has any disadvantages. This guy's dying. Why not let him try it if he wants to try it? And the thought is, look, there's a limited downside. Suppose it does have a horrible side effect and kills the person. Well, it was their only shot. They were going to die anyway. <laughs> Whereas if it saves them, there's a huge upside. So the thought is, yeah, I mean, don't have the FDA, in effect, use the same rules for everybody. Say, basically, you're healthy. We're not going to let you use this drug. We haven't you know, tested it enough yet. But this person, and we, here we, we want to play it safe. We want to do a lot of testing. This isn't an argument against the FDA. It's just saying, hey, wait, if somebody's really in one of these extreme circumstances, then let them try. Go ahead. Well, what if you had like, a situation where somebody had like, a leg injury, and you know you can like, save their life to just get off the leg, but you can take the risk to like, save the leg and try to save them. Right. Okay, good. This isn't some sort of very, <laughs> uh, 
there's still going to be a lot of complicated dilemmas. And if you're fond of watching, oh gosh, what's that hospital show my daughter loves? Grey's Anatomy. Anatomy, thank you. Um, yeah, they're, they're this, there's this sort of dilemma all the time, right? Where, uh, I mean, as far as I can tell, a huge amount of that show, the limited times I've seen it, are really spent on people's love lives. But, <laughs> but leave that aside, um, you've got these th medical dilemmas where it is like that. Wait, we could maybe save the leg, but that puts the person's life at risk. If we amputate, it's safer in terms of saving their life, but then they lose the legs. How do we do that? And, and I mean, that's a situation which is pretty extraordinary, and we still have, because there, there's still a lot to lose, right? I mean, losing a leg is really bad. Losing a life is really bad. So there's a big downside in both cases. Human bodies in those extreme circumstances are pretty fragile. And so if we're thinking, broadly speaking, how to formulate policies, we want to try to encourage anti-fragility. But once, let's say, your leg has been badly damaged in a fall, um, yeah, your life is pretty fragile. <laughs> and so we're still going to face a hard dilemma there. So I don't think this is meant to say, oh, well, you know, what's the downside of trying to save the leg? So you're dead, but you're going to be legless anyway, so how bad is that? Uh, still pretty bad, right? So, um, so yeah, I don't think this is going to give us clear direction in cases like that. Yeah, you, want, you had a question. Oh, okay, yeah, good. So, the huge romantic, the huge risky romantic gesture. Suppose things are going good in your relationship. Don't mess with it, okay? <laughs> Leave well enough alone. But suppose it's like, oh, I can tell things are going really bad. We're headed for a divorce or something. Then maybe try that big gesture. Suppose it completely backfires. Well, this relationship seemed pretty doomed anyway, so how much do you really have to lose? So... Um, yeah, and if you're trying to construct something that's a general strategy, it's kind of like, hey, look, um, just play it safe day to day, but do the big extraordinary risk-taking thing when you feel like you're in danger or the relationship is in danger or something like that. Um, yeah, I know of people who, you know, aren't like that, who surprise their partner with some huge thing, like, guess what? I bought a house <laughs> for us. <laughs> or, guess what? We're moving to, you know, the other side of the country. Um, this is very dangerous. <laughs> Maybe it's worth taking that sort of risk without consulting your partner if, um, you know, if things are already pretty broken and you think we got to do something. But otherwise, I would urge you not to do that sort of thing. Play it safe. Guess what, honey? I just bought a BMW. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so there's the general idea. Now, there are a couple of things that go along with this. Adopt this sort of idea. Try to do no harm. We're better at knowing what's wrong than knowing what's right. So the general thought here is, look, practice a strategy of non-intervention. So. The way I like to think of it is this. And this is one of my favorite slogans. I've got to confess, it's an excuse for laziness. That may be my main motivation. It's not really a theoretical motivation. But it's really just, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> yeah, what if it's slightly broke? Um, A wobbly table, yes. Well, you've identified exactly the reason why nothing in my house really works quite right in my cars. <laughs> I drove a car for years that I had to start by pouring gasoline into the carburetor, taking off the air filter. And, um, I could leave it unlocked anywhere because nobody could actually start it. Uh, <laughs> you had to know there was a gas can in the trunk and you had to take a part, part of the engine and pour gasoline directly in. And, and then you know you had to flutter the, the gas pedal just right. And, but yeah, that's sort of, so anyway, there is a problem here. What about things that are sort of broken? Uh, you have to decide what to do there. 
But the thought is, well, look, do no harm. So, yes, it is just laziness that I don't repair certain things <laughs> and allow them to be wobbly. However, I have to think, well, does fixing this risk harm to the thing and making it worse? So don't intervene and make the wobbly table broken completely. Um, my father-in-law um, used to do things like that. It's like, oh, yeah, this is wobbling, so I'll just get out the chainsaw and whack off the leg. And it's like, well, now <laughs> it's not really a table anymore. It doesn't have any legs. It doesn't wobble, but it doesn't really, you know. Um, one time he fixed our sofa, fixed our sofa, which was slightly wobbly. And as a result, the next time I sat down, it, it just collapsed completely. <laughs> so... Uh, so yeah, if it's slightly broke, think, can I fix the slightly brokenness without risking destroying the whole thing? Um, and if you can, then by all means do it. But if you can't, don't mess around with it. Well, this is going to tell us something that's actually pretty important in organizations. Because organizations have a tendency to do something else that causes serious problems. And in fact, the larger the organization, the more likely this is. So here's part of what we want. If we're thinking about anti-fragility and how to design an organization so that it's highly adaptive, highly flexible, it evolves, it learns, and it gets better and better at doing things. In fact, insofar as it makes mistakes, it learns from the mistakes. It doesn't actually get worse as a result. We want it to learn, right? And indeed, this is really how you learn, how you get better at doing lots of things. You tr suppose you're learning to cook. You try out a recipe, you think, oh, that didn't quite work. You, but you figure out, that was too salty. You know how to do it better the next time. Similarly, you're identifying Nash equilibria on a homework. And you mess it up, but you think, well, I can do better next time. Now I see what I did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Take that lesson. Uh, <laughs> Or, <laughs> uh, no, I haven't actually looked at them yet. That's just sort of a joke to make you nervous. <clears throat> but there, see, I should know. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It wasn't broken, but now I've made you all nervous, so I sort of <laughs> made it worse. So the thought is, look, we, we think about things like this, but we want the whole organization to learn. We want it to evolve. And how do we get it to do that? Here's the thing that is really crucial for this. And there are a couple of ways of approaching it. One way is to say, we want things to be modular. That is to say, we want to decentralize. There's somebody at our university, actually, who has been developing a theory of organizational structure along these lines. He calls it a cellular organizational structure. But the idea is you want the cells of the organization to be able to reorganize in response to problems. In something like the way brain cells, for example, will reorganize. If a part of the brain is injured, other parts of the brain will actually start taking over the activity. Suppose something happens that actually messes with a part of your visual cortex in such a way that, in effect, some of the cells are damaged. Other cells will move in that were doing something else and start taking over their jobs. And so one way to accomplish that is to make the organization highly flexible, highly modular, to decentralize things. So I suppose those are really two things, although they're connected. The different modules are going to be able to operate independently of one another, and they're going to be able to respond quickly to things. So we want them to be focused on the micro, <laughs> the, the smaller issues. We're going to put power down there, partly because now why? Suppose we say, we don't want all the decisions to be made up top. We want to have these modules that we can move around that are going to be flexible, but also we want to give them real decision-making power. Now, as with Wells Fargo, and we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, this can be taken too far. If they start pulling in a totally different direction away from the goals of the organization, that's bad. <laughs> However, there's a lot of advantage to having decision-making made on the ground. Why? Yeah. Good. It's going to be fast. Okay. When we decentralize, 
we've got people who are able to make responses immediately. Suppose I were not trusted to actually teach this class. And so I had to constantly be getting directions from somebody up in the tower. I would say, student asked this question, how do I answer? Okay, and they tell me, that's gonna slow things down pretty radically, right? Um, and, <clears throat> and similarly, suppose, I mean, some schools do this. Um, we have all curriculum decisions made by some central committee, and they tell me what books I have to use and so on, and what topics I have to cover. That's going to slow down the whole process of doing all this uh, extraordinarily. And in the military, who do you want to make the decisions in the midst of battle? You want the people who are there involved in the battle to be able to make the decisions. You don't want them constantly having to consult headquarters. Um, in fact, one of the great disasters of the First World War, actually many of the great disasters of the First World War, were due to just that. Um, the British landed um, on the peninsula by Gallipoli. Um, the, they encountered basically no resistance, and they were waiting for orders from headquarters. The obvious thing to do was to take the cliffs so that they were in a commanding position. Instead, they stayed on the beach for a week waiting for headquarters to tell them what to do. By the time they actually got the orders, well, take, go up the mountain, take the cliff, get the high position, Ataturk was already there. And the result of that was hundreds of thousands of deaths on both sides. Um, it was crazy. If only they had not consulted headquarters and just allowed the people on co in command there to say, hey, there's nobody here. Let's immediately start advancing up the hill. So it makes it much faster. There are other advantages. Yeah? Right, okay, good. The people on the floor there at Best Buy are gonna know the effect of price changes. They're going to know where to expect people to come much more effectively than some consultant or somebody in headquarters somebody else, somewhere else. Similarly, traders on the floor are gonna have a much better sense of what to do about prices. Um, or for that matter, people in a farmer's market are gonna have a better idea of what to do about prices than some economist actually proving some theorem and then applying it to a case. Now, how, why is that? Why are they able to do that? It's partly they can respond very quickly to subtle changes in information, but there's something else. Go ahead. Exactly. They have local knowledge. They know how people are going to react in that situation, they know that circumstance, they know those people, they know that setting. There's a huge advantage to that. Um, I have given talks at all sorts of universities around the country, and the groups I talk to are really different in different places. Um, there is no substitute for actually knowing something about that university students, that setting, and so forth. Um, and you can tell it right away. At some places, students just sit there. And no matter what, what you do, the students just sit there. You tell a joke, they just sit there. <laughs> uh, you know, you make what you think is a brilliant point, you're expecting nodding heads. Heads, they just sit there. At other universities, they're constantly like, wait, what about this, what about that? You know, this type of thing. At other places, they're just kind of like, oh God, who is this guy? Is this gonna be on the test, <laughs> et cetera? <laughs> And so um, there's no substitute for understanding the audience you're talking to, right? You have to know them. And similarly, in selling to them, you have to know those particular people. And of course, more than just knowing those people, you have to know a lot about that kind of circumstance and, well, and what kinds of judgments people make in that circumstance and so forth. Somebody's attitude about buying a taco is probably rather different from their attitude about buying an expensive camera. And You've got to build all of that in. Somebody in Best Buy on the floor knows, oh, you approach a customer about this product differently from you the way you approach them about that product. But that's hard for somebody at headquarters to understand. Are there other factors here? Well, I'll call this the BS factor. <laughs> the 
the way he puts it is this. It's way harder to micro BS than to macro BS. And I mean, you're in college, so you've heard a lot of fluffy, academic, jargony BS already. <laughs> but wait till you actually work for some large company. It gets worse, let me tell you. I mean, you think that your sociology professor is full of it. Wait till you hear some CEO uh, <laughs> or some, somebody like that. Um, I, actually, in one of my logic books, I have this example. Any more experienced administrator knows how to speak less meaningfully than any less experienced <laughs> administrator. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of truth to that. The higher up the ladder you go, the less information people convey in what they say. The more they can say things, and they'll use big words and so on, but you realize they're saying nothing. I think I mentioned at one point the organization I joined, and the person said, well, you know, each year we have a word around which we focus our organization, around which, and this year the word is implementation. <laughs> and blah, 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 blah. And as far as I could tell, the entire content of this like half hour speech was, we're gonna do stuff. <laughs> okay, I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, we're gonna do stuff, that's true, I mean, but like, I, I, you didn't have to give me a word full of, or a speech full of big words to tell me that. And in general, the closer you are to the problem, the harder it is to just think you're saying something or communicate all this fluff that in fact says nothing, right? If the person is there on the floor trying to figure out how to sell this product, and somebody says, well, of course, the key things to remember are, you know, um, implementation and blah, blah, blah. You're gonna think, blah, 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 blah. But somebody else who's on that sales floor and does a good job of it can say, ah, you gotta judge, you know, is, is this person who's kind of a novice? Then you're gonna have to help lead them through. On the other hand, right away, figure out, is this somebody who knows a lot about these cameras? If it is, then just give them information. Your job is to answer their questions and just make it clear you know what's going on. Um, but don't try to tell them what you think they ought to want, and so on and so forth. And that's something that somebody on the floor might know. But in short, it's pretty hard for that person to just give you a bunch of BS because they're talking about something that's right there in front of you. Similarly, the, the large-scale military commander um, or the commander-in-chief <laughs> can say a lot of fluffy things. Well, in pursuing our foreign policy, we have many goals. We have to carefully balance these goals against one another. We want to allow for a high degree of local autonomy and respect for local traditions. We also want to protect fundamental human rights and blah, 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 blah. And you're thinking, look, the people in this village are locking people in cages and burning them with torches. Um, what do you want me to do about that? <laughs> okay? And it's hard to BS that, right? It's like, yeah, I have to tell you what to do about that. Can, can we attack the village or not? Um, it's hard to give me BS about that question. Yeah. <clears throat> Ah, yes, you could do that. <laughs> you could actually do philosophy. Um, which brings us to an interesting question. How does one implement this in a more academic setting? I mean, one thought, thought you might have is, this says academics is BS, so stay away from it. <laughs> but there's another attitude you might have, which is, look, you want universities ideally to be like this too. So what would it be like to actually design a university along these lines? I mean, one thing is you would want it highly decentralized, and good universities are highly decentralized. Departments, well, <laughs> okay. Um, let me put it this way. Good universities used to be highly decentralized. Each department more or less did its own thing and had control of its own resources and so forth. When I arrived at this university almost 40 years ago now, each department had its own budget. It had its own set of faculty lines, its own budget for hiring graduate students as TAs, for supporting students with some scholarships and so forth. These decisions were made in each academic unit separately, pretty much autonomously. Now, there was officially some kind of guidance from above, some kind of check, but it was really pretty minimal. Um, departments were left on their own to decide what to do about these things. About 20 years ago, the dean's office took over a certain amount of this. So if somebody left a department, for example, 
the money for that job was no longer the department's. It went to the dean's office. At first, a little part of it went to the dean's office. Then it all went to the dean's office. And the dean would say, no, you must appeal to me. Okay? It's as if each feudal lord had control over the manor. right? And all of a sudden now, the duke says, ah, all lands that are abandoned by someone who dies revert to the duke. And then I will tell you to whom they will be assigned. Maybe I will just keep them, <laughs> etc. Okay, But then uh, within the past five years, the provost has taken all of that off. So now, is the, well, the provost isn't exactly the king, but who's right under the king? I don't know. I'm not a history major. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe the proper term is something like the vizier or the, the king's, uh, you know, the prime, yeah. I mean, yeah, except that's too democratic. Nobody elects this person. Uh, <laughs> but the thought would be, now even the duke loses that and everybody must appeal to, <clears throat> well, in effect, the king. And that has led to a large degree of centralization. So universities aren't nearly as decentralized as they used to be. But you would want them to be highly decentralized. You would want them to be highly modular. That is to say, it shouldn't be the case, really, that you would do what we do in universities. And you know, there is a department of English, a department of philosophy, and so on. And they've remained the same pretty much since 1250. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you would think, well, look, I mean, things are changing. So maybe there needs to be a department of logic, for example, where we put some people from philosophy and linguistics and computer science together. Maybe there should be a department of cognition where we put some psychologists and computer scientists and philosophers together. Maybe there should be, you know, and so on. And you would move people around rather flexibly. Um, and you would want lots of no local knowledge to control what goes on in the curriculum, what's required for that major, and that type of thing. So you'd want all this to be highly decentralized. That's one thing, and modular, so you can move things around. But it's not just that. You would want these things to have another important characteristic. And so this is actually the title of the latest book. <laughs> You would want people to have skin in the game. Now, as I say, that's sort of a disturbing metaphor. But the idea is this. People should have to face the consequences of their action. Think about how evolution happens. There is natural selection. There is random variation. The species improves, even though at the cost of some of the individual animals of the species. Um, how does that happen? <laughs> no, good. Good, good, good. There's competition. OK, good. Competition. And in that competition, some do better than others. And the ones that do better survive and, in fact, thrive, pass on their genes, as you put it. They actually are evolutionarily fit, and so they propagate and reproduce. But others either die or they don't reproduce. And so you've got, basically, a competition. You're exactly right about that. And in that competition, now if we generalize, some are going to thrive and do well, and others, well, they might literally die, <laughs> but they're also going to, let's just put it this way, they fail. And what happens to the ones that fail? Well, either they die out or their genes die out, right, because they don't succeed in passing them on. Yeah. Right. Okay, good. If this does depend a lot on a given environment. 
So if I am in, in fact, I mean, you're pointing out something that's actually quite tricky. Because I can have a certain kind of environment in which I thrive. Let's say I thrive in this ordinary environment where no black swans occur. But then something extraordinary happens. I die out. It doesn't necessarily mean that I was a bad person to have around here, right? It's just that I failed to adapt to that. Um, the dinosaurs were not able to adapt to a large meteor strike that radically changed the Earth's climate for a while. Um, does that mean, uh, well, yeah, dinosaurs were weak. They did not deserve to survive. Uh, not really, right? It was just an extraordinary event, and they were fragile. So you're quite right. There's going to be a certain amount. It would be nice to say, ah, oh, the fit <laughs> survive. The unfit don't. However, um, and partly because circumstances can change, partly because everybody is fragile, an extreme enough event can be enough to break anything. However, you could think, well, look, um, in our organization, we want it to be able to evolve. We want it to learn from mistakes as well as other things, right? And admittedly, circumstances can change. So what's been working in one way won't necessarily continue to work. How do we deal with that? Well, the way biology deals with it is through random variation, continuing to introduce some novelty into the gene pool. The way we can do it in our organization is by bringing in new people. Suppose an organization decides it's not going to hire any new people, or it will hire only very senior level people who have a great deal of experience elsewhere. It's, in effect, cutting off that source of variation in the gene pool. It's not going to be innovating. It's not going to be learning. So I think the organizational equivalent of what you're saying is make sure you keep bringing in new people. <laughs> and new people will then keep this variable so you don't get locked into one pathway that works well in one environment but doesn't work well in another. It, be, it produces a kind of fragility if you do that. You've got to keep the, the mix going. However, it is important that you allow people to fail. And what happens in a lot of organizations is that people transfer risks. So there's a fundamental rule here, which is don't transfer risk. You have to face the consequences of your actions. The risk that you take have to be yours, and you have to own up to it. Now, he says there's a serious problem. <laughs> Bureaucracy is essentially a tool for transferring risk, for isolating people from the consequences of their own decisions. And so that means, basically, avoid bureaucracy. And the consequence of that is going to be to say, mm, large organizations, which inevitably become bureaucratic, are going to engage in more and more transfer of risk. Fewer and fewer people are going to face consequences. They're going to learn less and less. They're going to get dumber and dumber. And so there is a huge danger to that. The bigger an organization, the dumber it gets. Now, how do you stop that? Well, one way is to adopt this bimodal strategy. And so you might have a sort of bureaucratic organization that plays it safe. But what a lot of Silicon Valley firms do, even big ones like IBM, is that they have a group dedicated to the extraordinary. Okay? In Silicon Valley, they call this the skunk works. <laughs> there are people who are hired for their sheer genius, basically. And they're told to go off and do stuff. And they do it with tremendous freedom. Very little oversight. They don't really have to report to people. People don't pay attention. Now, if they fail, if they accomplish nothing, well, they pay the price for that. But if, on the other hand, they come up with something big, it's huge. So suppose you were a university doing this. You might say, yeah, the average faculty member, they're going to spend lots of time in the classroom. And we'll ask them to keep on the breast, you know, at the frontiers of knowledge and do some research and so on. But actually, what universities really do, like, OK, here's our model. You'll spend half your time teaching, half your time doing research. That's a recipe for mediocrity, right? I mean, if you've got Einstein, do you really want him grading logic homeworks or physics homeworks? <laughs> Come on. Um, on the other hand, you know, um, if you've got a guy who's clearly not Einstein, <laughs> maybe the best use of that person is to put them in the classroom. Make them teach five classes a term, as I did in the fall. <laughs> Maybe that's the best thing you can do. And so the thought here would be, look, 
have most people doing more or less what they do, maybe more in the classroom than they are now, but take some people and free them up to do the work that is really going to produce phenomenal new knowledge. And so here, avoid the bureaucracy by saying, well, maybe you guys, you're never going to do much anyway, so forget it. But we're going to have this other group over here that we'll give maximal freedom to. But the key really is we need the organization to learn. And in order to learn, we have to make sure when people fail, they pay the price of the failure. That is shockingly rare. And indeed, his example of the horrible scenario we now often face in society is the Robert Rubin problem. He drives Citibank into the ground. It needs a government bailout, loses tons of money, and he gets 120 million golden parachute. All that risk was transferred ultimately to the, well, the shareholders and ultimately the taxpayer. That shouldn't happen, OK? If you destroy the company, you should face the consequences of that. So this is going to mean don't bail out failures. Don't isolate them. Stop taking people whose policies have failed and putting them on TV as experts and then appointing them as the secretary of blah, blah, blah in the next administration. Stop it. If they fail, they fail. They're out, OK? Try new people. And our organizations, the more bureaucratic they come, become, the less they do that and the dumber they get.